My name is Michelle Anduele, and I'm the Senior Director for Health Promotion with the Arthritis Foundation. It is my pleasure to speak to Dr. Junus Yazdani. Dr. Yazdani is Chief of Rheumatology for San Francisco General Hospital and the Alice Betts Endowed Professor of Medicine at UCSF. Welcome, Dr. Yazdani. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. Now, Dr. Yazdani, um, we're getting to the almost two-year anniversary for the first documented case of COVID in the United States in January 2020. It is so recent, even though it feels a little bit like a lifetime that we have been uh, dealing with COVID. Uh, for autoimmune patients such as myself, data is really what we're focused on. We're trying to get a better understanding of what the future holds for many of us. So could you share some of the data around the increased susceptibility to COVID infection for autoimmune patients and those on immunosuppressants? Sure, I'd be really happy to. <clears throat> so we can start at the beginning of the pandemic in, um, in Italy, where we know, you know one of the very first um, large outbreaks occurred. And the rheumatologists um, in Lombardy, Italy, actually did a really nice study where they surveyed uh, people who had rheumatic diseases and tried to see if the incidence of COVID-19 in people who had rheumatologic conditions was actually you know, higher or similar to the general population. And what they found in that early study was actually that the incidence was about the same. And so it provided early reassuring data. Since then, we've actually had some larger studies. Some of them have been across entire countries. So there was you know, one really nice study from South Korea looking at people going in for their health examinations. And they found that people who had rheumatic diseases did have a slightly higher risk of having COVID-19 compared to the general population controls, but the risk was only slightly higher. So those are two examples of studies. And in general, studies like those have found that there's either a similar or a slightly higher risk of getting COVID-19 in the first place for people who have rheumatic diseases. I see. Now, the term breakthrough infection is a term that a lot of autoimmune patients are, as you can imagine, concerned about understanding that there is a potential blunted vaccine response based on our medications. Could you put the breakthrough infections in context? Sure, I'd be happy to. So we have two types of evidence about you know, susceptibility to breakthrough infections. The first comes from laboratory scientists. And when, what these investigators have done is actually looked at antibody responses to vaccine in people who have rheumatic diseases and who are on various immunosuppressant drugs. And what they found is that, you know, pretty consistently, certain um, types of drugs seem to decrease the immune response to vaccination. The worst culprit is a drug called rituximab, which depletes the B cells in our body. And, you know, we expected that there was going to be a decreased vaccine response, and those laboratory studies really do show that. There's also another group of immunosuppressant medications, um, medications like mycophenolate, and also even prednisone seem to decrease this antibody response. So that's the evidence from the laboratory. But what about in the real world? Because sometimes laboratory data isn't what actually happens in real life. And what we've done with um, our group and the Global Rheumatology Alliance, which is really a group of rheumatologists who have been collecting clinical data during the pandemic, is record cases of breakthrough infections in people who are fully vaccinated to understand you know, who, who are the people that are getting serious breakthrough infections. And so um, as a late breaking abstract in, uh, in this ACR meeting, uh, two of my colleagues will be presenting um, data that show that among um, a cohort of people who have breakthrough infections, there were 22 people who had serious infections that required hospitalization. And actually over half of them were taking either rituximab or a drug called mycophenolate. It actually looked like people who were taking other types of drugs, for example, a lot of people wonder about anti-TNF biologics. Um, you know, those people largely actually weren't hospitalized if they had a breakthrough infection. So I think what we know so far from the laboratory data and then also this real world data is that there are certain drugs 
including drugs that deplete B cells like rituximab and immunosuppressant drugs like mycophenolate that put people at higher risk for breakthrough infections. And what this means clinically is that it is really important for those groups of people to get a booster vaccination um, and also to let their doctors know right away if they become infected with COVID-19, because we now have actually wonderful therapies that can help the disease from progressing. That includes the monoclonal antibodies, which can be given as post-exposure prophylaxis or for treatment of early infections. And there's also an oral antiviral um, that's been making headline news that should hopefully become available soon. Uh, but it does require that people let their doctors know right away because a lot of these therapies work best if they're given early. Oh, that is really good news, um, Dr. Yazdani. Thank you so much for sharing that. It really gives us a, a sense of comfort for me as an autoimmune patient knowing um, some of that data. So let's talk a little bit about outcomes. So for those who are infected, who may end up hospitalized or with severe illness, what is the data showing in terms of recovery? Yeah, so the good news is that actually most people, even people who are heavily immunosuppressed actually do recover from, from COVID-19. Um, but let's talk about you know, who is not doing as well. And what we've done to try to answer this question is actually collect data from rheumatologists around the world um, using, you know, basically like a case reporting mechanism and a registry. And over the last, you know, year and a half, rheumatologists around the world have just really enthusiastically participated in this Global Rheumatology Alliance registry. We have 21,000 cases of people with rheumatic disease who have had COVID-19 with detailed clinical information. It's a very um, incredible data source that really was just crowdsourced data collection during the pandemic. And we've learned a lot. Um, maybe the, the most important thing is that, you know, there are some patients that look like they're more likely to be hospitalized, mechanically ventilated, and unfortunately die from COVID-19. And again, that drug called rituximab, which depletes B cells in the body, appears to be a culprit. We found a fourfold higher odds of severe outcomes in people who were taking that medication. There were also some other medications, for example, immunosuppressant drugs, um, a drug called sulfasalazine, and then prednisone, especially when it was taken at higher doses, um, like more than 10 milligrams a day, associated with more severe outcomes. Although we talk a lot about the drugs, when you really look at the big picture of the data though, you know, a lot of the risk factors for severe COVID-19 in people who have rheumatologic conditions are actually very similar to the general population. So things like older age and comorbidities like diabetes and heart disease, renal disease, lung disease, those things actually are the primary drivers of risk. And so the drugs that I mentioned are a risk that we're seeing above and beyond what we would expect, you know, with those other risk factors. I see. So really what you're sharing with our patients is if you have a well-controlled disease, um, if you are not of older age and you are, don't have any comorbidities, then there is always the risk of you know, COVID hospitalization, but those factors are actually more important than their rheumatological disease. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's okay. exactly right. And you know, one other thing that I didn't say is that you know, the data are very clear that having you know, good control of the rheumatologic condition is associated with better outcomes. Um, it's an interesting finding. And I think it just really emphasizes how important it is for people to get regular care and make sure they have access to care during the pandemic. And, you know, sometimes I think there's a, there's been a huge burden placed, placed on our, auto, you know, patients with autoimmune disease during the pandemic, there's all these scary messages that are coming out like, well, you'll be fine if you're not immunosuppressed and things like that. And I, and I think that I also want to just provide some reassurance to people now that we know what the risk factors are for more severe outcomes. I think we can just counsel our patients, activate them to advocate for themselves. You know, if they get COVID-19, we have therapies now that can prevent the disease from becoming more severe. 
They should contact their healthcare providers. They should get the monoclonal antibody therapy as quickly as possible. We have this oral antiviral on the horizon. The booster vaccines will help. So it's not, you know, um, a dire situation, but we do need to make sure that we protect people that are vulnerable. Dr. Yazdani, thank you so much for that reassurance, that clinical reassurance of the varied options that our patients have. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.